I am Jinal Dadia. I am, I am a PhD candidate at the Faculty of Law and I'm part of the SRI on Reproduction. And what I'm welcoming you today is to the Early Researchers Seminar Series that is hosted by Cambridge Reproduction. And we are always very grateful to the volunteer coordinators for organizing this series and to all the speakers who have agreed to take part, including our two speakers today. To tell you a little bit about the seminar series, it takes place online on the third Thursday of each month at 1 p.m. And details of forthcoming seminars can be found on the SRI's website, and I believe should also reach you using the chat function about now. Um, Cambridge Reproduction itself is an interdisciplinary initiative that brings together researchers from across the university who have an interest in any aspect of reproduction. And as you can imagine, that is a lot of fields and it includes everything from science, technology, medicine, up to the arts and humanities. Membership is open to all staff and postgraduate students at the university and it gets you access to all of our events, funding schemes and our regular newsletters, which have research highlights, events and opportunities in reproduction research. To join, um, you can just download the membership form from our website, um, which is uh, www.repro.cam.ac.arc. And once again, a link to this should reach you using the chat function. We're always interested in receiving abstracts for future seminars, such as the one today. So if any postgraduate students or postdocs would like to take part in the seminar, please follow the link on the website once more on your chat um, and reach out to us and we can slot something in. Um, so with that background, um, I'd like to introduce to you the two speakers that we have today. So first we have Alicia Jane, who is a research associate at the Department of Pharmacology within Cambridge. She began her career at the University of Western Australia, where she got a PhD in examining human cells in human milk. Upon completing her studies, she received a fellowship from the International Society for Research into Human Milk and, and Lactation to enable her to cross the globe to work in Munich. And here she was further accepted into a postdoctoral fellowship program working in the human mammary cell research group led by Dr. Christina Scheel. And in 2019, she was invited to join Dr. Khal Valid Khalid's research group in Cambridge where she continues her work. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Alicia Jane to take you through her presentation today um, at the end of which we will then um, move on to Vandita's presentation and then our questions. So I'm really excited to tell you about a project that's actually recently been published um, in Nature Communications, and it's looking at the transcriptional changes in the mammary gland during lactation revealed by single cell sequencing of cells from human milk. Um, I'm also very happy to take any questions if something's not clear at the end of this. So I realize, as you said, we're a collective pool of different um, researchers, so I want to make this as accessible as possible. So my interests are um, looking at trying to understand how the adult mammary gland changes during different stages of adult human development. So in its resting state, so non-pregnant, non-lactating, um, the mammary gland has kind of a ductal tree um, embedded in stroma and fatty tissue. Um, however, at this point, it's not functional, so it's not able to uh, produce milk. After a process of secretory differentiation that occurs during pregnancy, the mammary gland is then primed for milk production, which then subsequently occurs um, during lactation. So post um, delivery of the infant, then mature milk is able to be produced. Following this process, the mammary gland then returns to a somewhat resting state um, in a process called involution. And this happens after weaning of the infant. Now I say somewhat resting state um, because there is evidence in uh, animal studies that suggests that there might be some sort of an imprinting um, or changes in the mammary gland that occur over this process. And why this is important is because there seems to be a complex relationship with um, pregnancy and lactation or parity um, with breast cancer risk. So one of the central themes of my research is to try to understand um, what are the cell types and pathways responsible for milk production and mammary maturation. To give you a little bit of an overview as to um, how the mammary gland looks, as I mentioned, we have this uh, ductal structure at the end of which are lobes. And these lobes are kind of grape-like structures that then kind of 
further um, can be segregated into these little um, alveoli. So within the alveoli, we have two major cell types. We have luminal cells, so they kind of line the lumen of the mammary gland. And these are the cells that produce milk during lactation. On the outside, we have these basal myopithelial cells. So these are the cells that actually contract um, to help the milk then be transported through these structures, um, through the ducts to be delivered to the infant. Now, really interestingly, we can separate out the cells of the breast using um, different protein markers. So what's done is basically cells are stained for different markers to see whether they have a particular protein or not. And then that helps us characterize the different cells. Um, what I'm showing you here is a flow cytometry plot. So this is where along each axis, we have uh, different ways to kind of categorize the cells. So along here, we have the forward scatter, which helps segregate the cells based on their size. And then we have CD45 and CD31. So these are very um, unique markers that specify the immune or endothelial cells. Um, and so each of these dots represents a single cell and kind of as it's sliding along this scale shows you how much of a protein it's expressing or in this particular case, how big it is. If we focus on the population of cells that are not immune or endothelial and we look more at the um, epithelial population, so the ones that are functional, um, this is what we can segregate the cells into, these four kind of different major populations, which you can see circled here. And so what we have are two major luminal populations. We have this hormone responsive uh, luminal population. We have these contractile basal mypothelial cells, um, as well as these luminal progenitor cells. And these cells are of particular interest to our research group um, because they're thought to be the cell of origin for many different types of breast cancers. So we're really interested in understanding how cells like these, like the luminal progenitors are changing during different stages of mammary gland development. So from my side, I'm really interested, as I mentioned, in trying to understand the changes that occur during pregnancy and lactation. Um, as you can imagine, obtaining breast tissue from women who are pregnant or lactating is quite difficult. Um, what we have been able to do though, is take breast tissue samples from women who have undergone um, aesthetic breast reduction. So where they've made the choice to do that for themselves, and then they've actually donated the tissue for the studies. What we can do then is um, kind of uh, mince up the tissue and then uh, do enzymatic digestions upon them. And then what we get out at the end of the day are single cells that we can then study. Alternatively, what I've found is that if we collect milk samples from different women and we do a simple um, uh, centrifugation, so washing steps and, and separating them based out on their size, we can also get cells uh, from the milk. And these are representative of cells during lactation. Now, what I found is if I put these cells into culture, what we get is the cells start to grow. And this is fantastic because this is a way that we can model the cells and understand how they might be growing, differentiating, and then also what functions they're performing. So we've done this for both the breast tissue as well as the milk cells. And we found that they can grow kind of on a mono layer. So um, in, one, in 2D um, or in 3D to generate these uh, mammary organoids. So one major question I had from, you know, just this, this part of the research is what are the actual cell types in the human milk and how are they different to those in resting breast tissue? So that's the central question of my research. Now, how we characterize cells, we can use a few different tools to do that. So if you think of just a cell with a, a nuclei inside, we have a number of different components that we can look at. So from a DNA perspective, each each um, cell within an individual's body is going to have the same DNA. And what specifies a cell one from another um, is the RNA and protein content. So the RNA is kind of um, the message of the DNA. And then the protein is, is, the, is the part of the cell that's actually performing a function. So the RNA is encoding for a specific gene. Um, and then eventually this will become a protein in most cases. So we can examine uh, a cell's RNA profile or protein profile using different techniques, um, such as sequencing as I've used, um, or flow cytometry as I've shown you previously. So what I've done to start to analyze these different cells is I've collected breast tissue samples from a number of women, and I've also collected milk samples from another uh, number of women. And then I've you know, done the techniques as I've showed you before to then get out single cell suspensions. 
Now, if we put these single cells onto a fluidic system where they're encapsulated a single cell to a bead, we can then lyse those cells and then um, kind of optimize the RNA so that we can then downstream actually assign a single cell uh, to a specific patient and then look at the gene expression profile of those cells. So this is going to help us characterize what types of cells they are and what functions they're performing. So this is another uh, kind of um, dimensional reduction plot. So what we have here again is each dot represents a single cell. And as you can see, there's quite a few uh, cells on this plot. I've colored each of these cells um, depending on where they've come from, which participant, whether they're from breast tissue or from milk cells. Um, and what you can see is that we have these two major pink clusters. So these are two major uh, cell types coming from the milk a mixture of cells coming from both the milk and the breast tissue, and then some very clear clusters coming from only the breast tissue. And so we wanted to kind of understand exactly what cell types there were. And we found that these, uh, these two pink clusters, these LC1 and LC2, these correspond to luminal cells, which are kind of producing the milk. So we can see the cells that are producing milk within the milk, which is really cool. Um, and what we found was that milk contains these two major secretory luminal cell populations, LC1 and LC2, um, as well as a mixture of immune cells. So firstly, just focusing on the luminal compartment or the epithelial compartment, we wanted to see are these cells similar or different from each other, as well as to the cells in their breast tissue. So first of all, we decided to compare LC1 to LC2 to see what genes are differentially expressed between them. Um, and therefore, if they are performing different functions, like maybe LC1 is producing um, more fats, whereas LC2 might be transporting more um, different metal ions or something like this into the milk. And so we did a differential gene expression analysis. So this is a volcano plot showing how different a gene is differentially expressed and then the significance value. And we found from this that thousands of genes were upregulated in LC1 um, compared to thousands of genes that upregulated into LC2. So already we're seeing that LC1 and LC2 seem to be these really novel uh, secretory populations in the milk and they do seem to be quite different to each other. What I did after this was, uh, with some help, perform uh, a regulon analysis. So this is looking not just at one gene, but it's looking at a network of genes that have been shown to be um, co-expressed together. Um, so for example, here I pulled out SOX, um, SOX10. So this shows you that this gene has an association with all these downstream genes here, and that they're actually kind of co-expressed in these cells, um, and it's different. Um, SOX10 in the LC1 compared to the other uh, regulons. So what we're seeing is that this LC1 and LC2 have very different transcriptional profiles and seem to be differentially regulated. And as I said, that's interesting because it seems like they're performing slightly different functions. Um, it could be that in certain disease cases, maybe um, such as low milk supply, maybe there might be some more LC1 versus LC2 or an imbalance. This is something that's really interesting for us to take um, forward in the future. Now we wanted to understand as well the immune cell compartment. Um, so see what sort of immune cells are kind of contributing either to the immunity of the mammary gland itself from the breast um, or potentially are being delivered to the infant for potential reasons. Um, and what we found is when we looked at the mixture of immune cells that they did seem to represent um, kind of all the major immune cell subtypes that we were expecting from the breast tissue uh, were actually in the milk as well. And so monocyte and lymphocytic lineage cells um, can be isolated from milk um, and resting breast tissue. They seem to be quite similar, but there are some subtle differences that we're quite interested in looking at further. Now, one thing that we were quite interested to see is how were the cells in the milk interacting? Is there a potential feedback mechanism from the immune cells to say the luminal cells that might be somehow changing the composition of the milk or some sort of a feedback system. So we wanted to start to investigate that. And so what we did is perform network analysis. So we looked at each of the cells um, gene expression profiles, and we wanted to see whether um, certain cells, if they had a receptor, then other cells might be um, secreting a uh, ligand, such as a hormone that would then uh, that would then connect with the receptor on the cell. Um, and then therefore it would 
produce downstream, downstream um, kind of signaling pathways in those cells that kind of affect them. So some sort of a feedback mechanism between these cell types. Now we found a range of really interesting pathways and we're still detangling them as to exactly what they mean. Um, but for example, if we look at EGF, so epithelial growth factor, um, we see that the immune cells are actually signaling to our um, luminal cluster one cells, um, which as I said, this interaction could be really interesting to better understand how milk composition changes or whether there's some sort of a support for the infant that's arising from this. So we found these putative interactions that were identified from this analysis between the cells in the milk, both the immune cells as well as the luminal cells uh, in milk. Now, as I mentioned, a central research question that I had was to try and understand how the cells in milk are actually different to the cells in the breast, with the hope that this will give us some insight into the changes that are occurring during lactation. So what I've done here, I'll, I'll break down the plot for you, don't worry. <laughs> but basically what we have um, along the y-axis is a scoring system. So this is a network of genes that will change um, and be different spe uh, specifically for different cell subtypes. Um, what I have here along the x-axis is our different cell types. And each of these is a, is a single dot. So it shows how each of the gene expression profile of a single cell within a group of cells is reflecting you know, a specific cell type. So for example, what we have here is a hormone responsive score. So one specific luminal cell type. And we see that the cells that we identified as hormone responsive have a very high score for this particular uh, mark, set of markers, um, which was really encouraging to see. We saw that the cells that are associated with the stroma are actually upregulated, um, with, had an upregulated stromal score. We found that the basal myopithelial cells had a higher uh, myopithelial score. But really interesting, what we found was not only did the luminal progenitor cells, but also the luminal cells in the milk, they were, they were all upregulated for this luminal progenitor score. And as I said, that's really interesting because we're seeing this relationship between um, the between parity and breast cancer. And as we mentioned, this luminal progenitor score, this luminal progenitor cells might have something to do with these aggressive breast cancers in the future. So we're trying to basically untangle that relationship. Now, if we compare the cells in the milk compared to the breast tissue cells, particularly these luminal progenitor cells, again, we get thousands of differentially expressed genes showing very clearly that they're performing different functions, which makes sense. You've got cells within the resting breast compared to cells that are actively making milk during lactation. We assigned each of these uh, genes to pathways um, and unsurprisingly, a lot of the genes uh, that were highly expressed within the milk cells were genes, were genes associated with kind of lactation, secretion, fatty acids and synthesis, synthesis and things like this. Um, whereas conversely in the uh, luminal progenitor cells, what was higher were cell adhesion. So you can imagine that the cells within the breast um, are kind of sitting there, they're adhering to each other, whereas the cells in the milk have lost that function. And so what we're really clearly seeing is that these milk luminal cells most resemble luminal progenitor cells, as well as they express different genes that we can then hopefully use in the future to try and put together kind of pathways to better understand how different components of the milk are actually made. And just to kind of go over everything that I've shown you, uh, just in summary, we found that human milk contains two secretory luminal clusters distinct from non-lactating tissue cells. Um, and they do seem to resemble these luminal progenitor cells in the normal breast. There does seem to be an enrichment of, in li of lipid production pathways in secretory milk cells, as well as a down regulation of adhesion pathways. And what we're hoping is that this work is going to provide a really rich resource for helping to construct and explore biosynthesis pathways associated with human milk production and transport. We hope to take this uh, work in, in, in so many different directions, but just to start off, I really want to help untangle what are the biosynthesis pathways that are involved in human lactation for each of the components in milk. Um, as well as see how these might be affected by maternal genetics. I also want to understand what are the mechanisms behind women who have low milk supply? And is there a way that we can help kind of support these women to be able to produce milk? And lastly, we have the question is whether, because the cells in milk have some luminal progenitor qualities, is it possible that we can use them as a preclinical tool for early detection of breast cancer? 
So I'd like to thank you and the network for having me and for listening to the talk. Um, and of course, to acknowledge my research groups. So the work started in Munich uh, with the Schill Research Group, and then now it's been moved to the Khaled Research Group, both in the Department of Pharmacology, as well as the Stem Cell Institute. We've had many funders as well as collaborators um, and lots of support to do this work. So thank you all for listening and I'm ready for questions when you are.